it's it's learning or earning <laughs> it, mm. it's it's really that that simple um and uh after you know we 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 exited spot um you know the the earning part didn't matter as much but the learning part mattered a lot or it took on more emphasis and so in in many scenarios i kind of feel if we aren't learning if we aren't growing if i'm if i'm not excited if i'm not enjoying myself life's too short Southeast Asia's economy in aggregate is now more than 3 trillion, having quadrupled in size since 2000 and more than doubled since 2010. Few emerging markets have this sort of track record. With a young and growing population, rapid digitalization, a growing list of investors doubling down, this is fueling the rise of hypergrowth companies, Grab, GoTo, Traveloka, Shopee, Cairo, to name a few. Yet beneath these headlines, these companies have been staying private for some time, raising more and more mega rounds to actually keep up with the burn of expansion, acquire adjacent businesses, compete with rivals, and more recently stave off the losses brought about by COVID-19. All this in a region where IPOs are few and far between. Southeast Asia has reached a point where growth stage investors that have been funneling the big tickets are now itching for an exit. All cards are on the table. This week, we dive deep with Rajiv Kashyap in Singapore, investment director at Cathay Innovation, an early and growth stage venture capital firm with 1.5 billion assets under management across San Francisco, Paris, Shanghai, and Singapore, and is closely affiliated with Cathay Capital Private Equity, a global private equity firm with 3 billion in AUM. From the lens of a management consultant turned operator turned funder, Rajiv talks about what it takes to be an entrepreneur's first phone call in the great and not so great times and the real landscape of growth stage companies in Southeast Asia. You don't want to miss it. Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. Pleasure to be back here. I'm uh, so excited to dig in. I mean, we already got started. I think, you know, we can't help <laughs> ourselves, but just dig in straight away. So, um, best that we get started here. So let's get, you know, deep into the first part, which is really about your career, Rajiv. You know, I've, I've been so intrigued uh, and we talk a little bit about this, you know, about the shift of cultures. You started in the U.S. and are now, you know, working in the in, in the Asia space and, and I'm sort of doing the opposite in some way, but both of us are very, very much, you know, rooted in, in uh, the belief of the power of Southeast Asia and, and everything that's happening. But you started as a consultant uh, in the TMT sector, actually, you know, interesting fact, I, I came across one of your articles in 2015, where you wrote about the future of IoT and predicted yep. that in 2020, uh, each of us would have four devices. So I think you're about right there. But uh, tell us about this transition. Uh, you know, the internet never forgets. So consultant, startup, CFO, and then now investor, was this an intentional path? You clearly have done your research, Jesus. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we could totally trade if you if you want to do the Asian thing and and, and you want me you want me back in in the states. I'm happy to do that for a bit, um, given given COVID and all of the lockdowns we've been in. But that's a story yeah. for another another day. Um, was it intentional? Uh, no, it was not intentional. Um, you know, I started my career at AT and T doing corporate development, corporate strategy. Always wanted to be a consultant. Had hired a bunch of consultants, um, and then was told I had to go to business school to make that happen. Um, did it? Got a job um, at at the Parthenon Group, and then subsequently mm -hmm. went on to lead uh, Booz and Company's technology practice uh, out of New York, and. Uh, I think the one thing that always bugged me about consulting was that I was I was I was doing a lot of work for private equity and for venture capital, um, but never really felt close to the operations. Um, I would I would recommend deals. This is a good deal. This is a not so good deal. 
um, but would never do more than more than that and kind of see what what happens behind the curtains. And so, um, Spot and uh, and then turning into startups and and specifically the finance function was was a good opportunity for me to to really experience that operational capability. Um, right. Spot came out of you know just a need for I have two two dogs uh, I call them my two marshmallows marshmallows <laughs> right and um, and 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 we just didn't find a great daycare and so we, you know the the the, the entrepreneur and he said hey look let's just go build one uh, that we like and and, and, and right. we think we could do really well with that um, and we did and we scaled it we scaled it. Um, you know, pretty quickly and pretty phenomenally. And then with the startups piece, um, I really wanted to get into the chaos of startups. I, I was I was sort mm-hmm. of enthralled with um, uh, chaotic environments, and I said, "Hey, how do I how do I can how, how do I create structure of a consultant within the chaos of a startup, um, and and then find a way to scale." And um, I'd never been to Southeast Asia um, prior to this. I'd never been to Singapore, and um, an opportunity came up, and I couldn't say no. And so, myself, my wife, our uh, son, and our two marshmallows moved across the world uh, right. to, to Singapore to 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 do that. And then, as I did that, started to learn a little bit about Cathay. Had met my partner here. Um, a few times and you know just the timing just made sense last year and, and sort of made the plunge to VC again none of these moves were intentional um, they were mm-hmm. kind of just you know, right place right time felt right team felt right uh, opportunity felt right I felt not learning in one and, and then moving on to the next and so um, yeah it's been it's been it's been fun so far uh, love that so Rajiv you mentioned a few things and one of it was that you moved on when you felt you weren't learning was that a mantra that you you kept i mean as you're thinking about your career and i'm thinking about all the listeners here you know many of them as you see in southeast asia right a lot of them have transitioned from uh, like you being consultants investment bankers uh but leaving the security of corporate into the entrepreneurial realm um how do you think about your career in each phase yeah um it's it's learning or earning (laughs) it Mm. is it's really that that simple um and uh after you know we 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 exited spot um you know the the earning part didn't matter as much but the learning part mattered a lot or it took on more emphasis and so in in many scenarios i kind of feel if we aren't learning if we aren't growing if i'm if i'm not excited if i'm not enjoying myself life's too short um and so i'm i'm one of those folks that that actually doesn't pay as much attention to length of length of time in one specific place. Uh, I get bored really quickly and, and want to be in two three different things at, at a time. And that sort of worked really well when I was in consulting and that works even better when I'm in venture because I get to be a part of boards of a number of companies that I really love and admire, founders I really love and admire. And so I get to context switch and topic switch uh, you know, across my day, which is which has been really, really helpful for me. Love that. So, so tell me a little bit about. I mean, spot. Um, this this part of your story really intrigued me. It it was a side hustle, right? So you were you know working full time in a very demanding job at that time, and yes. decided that this was a need, and and you did this in Dubai. How how did you build while having a full time career, um, and then managing a pretty awesome exit? If we can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um. So we uh, there was there was a, there was definitely a need. Uh, we built it in New York and and Dubai, um, and th- there was a hundred percent a need in, in in the market. We love the brand. We love what uh, what what we could do with it, and kind of put my wife and I put our spin on it. Um, and you know, it was it was more myself on the design and on the business plan and on a little bit on the execution up front, but it was a lot more of my wife uh, on, on the sustained continuity and, and running day to day. You know, one day we decided, you know what, let's, uh, let's kind of, we had, we got an inbound offer. Let's go build something else uh, with the money. Uh, a part of mm-hmm. me was like, let me go retire for, you know, and then, and, and not have to do anything else for a little while. Um, and, and that period of our lives lasted about six months before I got super bored and- <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I read a lot of books, but that was kind of kind of all I got to do. 
and, uh, right. and and so that was it. So so for us, it's always been like I said, learning, learning, and earning. And um, and mm. you know, Spot was a really good experience in terms of being an operator, which is why when I meet founders today. Um, I empathize with all of what they're going through. Uh, you know, right. making payroll is not easy. Getting to profitability is not easy. Uh, getting product market fit, but then maintaining product market fit in a ev- you know mm. evolving competitive market is not easy. Um, and so I've been there. Uh, the only difference is I never raised venture. I we we bootstrapped it our, ourselves. Um, right, but. Um, but but the the journey is 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 the same, um, and so the scale might have been slightly different, but the journey is the same. And so I I, I bring a lot of that into into my discussions with founders and in, in, in how we, um, you know how we how we yeah. talk about and relate to the same set of problems. Yeah, so I definitely want to dive deeper into that in terms of your learning and how that's influenced you as an investor. But um, with this side hustle it still intrigues me because I, I can't find more uh, depth in, in where you've talked about this so I really want to dig it out from you but in thinking about your side hustle to that point of exit right you had an inbound was that something that you had uh, put in place as a strategy let's do this for x amount of time you know how did you build with Natasha was it with the you know I understand you bootstrapped it but a lot of times side hustles can fall into the category of just being a lifestyle business, right? Something you care about, uh, but it never really gets to that stage. So how did you think about this and, and how did you and Natasha build? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of um, uh, a side hustle, it was always meant to be that, right? Um, it was never meant to be uh, more. And so as, as you sort of categorize the lifestyle business, it was ex- is exactly how, how it was mm-hmm. designed. Um, so, so there was never, you know, even on the periphery, uh, oh, if we, you know, do this, then it'll attract this investor or whatever. Um, I think the way it worked is as we were building a really good product organically and as we were scaling organically and we did very little marketing, it was all word of mouth. And that's sort of what we continue to do in, with, the, with the business now in Dubai. Um, we, what we found was that, uh, you know, if you build, they will come. And so our customers mm-hmm. started coming from multiple locations and asking, hey, could you build a location here? Could you try and look at something there? And and so it sort of built on top of each other um, to a point where it got to a scale that made it made a lot of sense for a, a strategic to come in with a little bit of private equity money um, to 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 buy the thing up, right? right? And, and they put money in front of us that, Frankly, I'd never seen before, uh, and mm-hmm. and I couldn't say no to, um, and and but it was never designed as hey we're going to get to this point and then and then have an have an exit. And I think you know those types of stories are are the best ones because yeah. you're you designed it and you build something for the right reasons uh, because mm-hmm. you care. It, it's 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 throwing off a little bit of side cash for you. Um, and most importantly, because my two dogs, iPod and Nano, got to go to daycare <laughs> um, for free. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's kind of why why we built it, right? And um, got it. And then if it turned out to be a little bit more than that, then then mm. all of that is is a bonus. Right. So, are you still involved now, or was it a full uh, exit where? So um, we exited in North America. We're still mm-hmm. involved in uh, the, the business that's based in Dubai. Right. Got it. Okay. Great. So now the next part, which is what we talked about, you know, uh, and, and you started a little bit in terms of how you empathize with founders a lot more because you've been there. Um, how else, you know, whether that's in your execution or the way you're thinking about it, even, even from your consulting days, how has your past informed some of what you're doing right now as an investor? Yeah, I think, you know, um, in a market like this, Right, it is incredibly easy to get carried away with uh, the deals because there's just so much coming at you, and they're coming at you from different places. Uh, and because we're a global fund, we see we see it literally from every country, and you know we're not restricted to certain regions. And it's really hard to take a step back and think. To to me as an investor, this is just another deal, but to mm-hmm founder this is their life's work 
This is their life's yeah. journey. This is what they're going to be known for. And in some cases in Asia, if they fail, there may not be a second chance, right? And, yeah. and, and so for me, that is a very, very serious responsibility. And having been a consultant, you know, worked alongside founders and worked alongside investors um, and seeing a lot of money being created, but also equally a lot of money being eroded, value being eroded. Uh, and then working alongside founders and being one myself, uh, I, I do not take that responsibility for granted. And so, yes, there'll be deal after deal. A deal my calendar is typically filled with 30, 40 meetings of deals a week. But it's really hard to pay attention and be like, okay, you know what? So I, I, I need to be 100% switched on for this. Because mm. even if I don't like the subject, even if I don't think the founder is that great, even if I don't think the business is going to make it, I owe them that respect uh, to, to, to be engaged and to be plugged in. And so I feel like that's one of the things that I feel I do different from, you know, your standard VC only because it's been informed by a bunch of life experiences that are slightly, slightly off the beaten path, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think that's so important, you know, to, um, really be prepared to really take this seriously and have that respect for, you know, a lot of them, some of them, I mean, I was just speaking, you, you probably know this founder, I was speaking with Rosalind uh, and she'll be yep. on the show next from CXA and she literally took all her savings plus her husband's savings <laughs> um, and got into a tip. And, and, you know, it's a very unique person to, that's an entrepreneur, right? Who's so obsessed with the problem and is yep. willing to, to get to all these things, but then to not have the appreciation from the VC side is just, um, Heartbreaking, I think, for the founder. So it's so very important. Next week, that should be a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the other part that I want to unpack from from this that that you talk about in terms of being an effective VC, you know, we also have many VCs on the show, many who are um, early in their VC journey and, and are thinking about how do I. As the, the meme and the joke goes, right, every VC is asking, how can I add value? How can I be helpful to you? And I spoke to one of your partners who, um, you know, of course, had rave reviews, but particularly said that um, your intuition and, and just, you know, your ability to very quickly be versatile and bring out the best deals and win those deals very early on as a, you know, as an investment director in a huge global entity, right? Let's talk a little bit about the politics here. Many of us, you know, get into big, large firms, you know, a huge AUM, but you're also, you know, there's a little bit of what people don't talk a lot about, which is finding your place and then, you know, not just writing the memo, but winning those deals with the conviction that you have. How have you thought about this? And, you know, tell us a little bit about how you felt, you know, you were most effective. Yeah. So I think the first thing, um, that folks need to understand is that Cathay is so different from any other VC out there. And I, and I, and I mean this in the most earnest, uh, in the most earnest way possible. Right. Um, for a few reasons, one, all of our V all of our LPs are corporate, uh, corporates. Mm. So the largest corporates in Europe, um, think, uh, you know, um, L'Oreal, for example, or Total make up our LP base. Um, and so, you know, we, we get, get a lot of knowledge from that LP base and we, we kind of have a really good pulse on the street of what's actually happening uh, in big business and then how that translates to, to startups. Um, the second thing that's unique about us is that we're truly a global firm. Um, and so we're eight offices across the globe. We're part of a much larger private equity firm, four and a half billion dollars in, in management. And, um, and we act as a global firm. And so, for example, if I know enterprise SaaS really well, but there's a deal happening in the US or in you know, uh, France, I'll get pinged on that because I know that topic you know, incredibly well and we, I'll be a part of that deal team. Um, and then our firms re re rewards everybody all the way from the top to the bottom uh, with carry. Uh, and everybody is part of the carry program and, and the carry is also global. And so it's not because, hmm. you know, I invested in Finexel or Coherent and somebody else invested in Chime. Uh, that's all shared capital, right? And so I say this because what it does is it takes a lot of the pressure off of the individual wolf hunting performance. This is a right. family. This is where, where we hunt as a family. And, and so... When I speak to a founder, Nicholas and I, who tag team on almost everything, 
bring the entire firm with us. So think about it, right? I was speaking to a founder today. Uh, she's in the beauty space. Uh, when I said she in, in beauty space, there's like, you know, five of them. Um, and her business is growing off the charts. And I said, you know what? How about if I brought in Unilever? And, you know, Unilever, L'Oreal, and I put in some money equally and we do this deal together. Um, and, and she's like, if you could, if you could arrange that and we could have strategic value, that, that, you know, that, 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 that would be amazing. Right. And that's the difference when, when you are in a setup like ours, where I'm not thinking about the politics of carry or who gets what, or who, this is, you know, territorial, this deal, that deal. And I'm really just thinking about the founder and how do we make this a best, the best experience and the best outcome for the founder. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how we differentiate and, you know, Nick, Nick is kind with, uh, with his, um, with his words. Um, but, but in reality, uh, it's, it's completely a team effort in, in terms of doing and, and, and winning. And I'm, I'm yeah. a small cog in a very, in a very big wheel. Yeah. So Rajiv, I mean, you know, this is, um, I, we were talking about this previously, you know, is this normal to, to share carry? I mean, I've, I'm, I, I don't know. I think I've become very Americanized in that, you know, it's very individualistic. There's definitely turf. You, you know, people say you work together, but there is that element of competition, which Americans do, do thrive in. And, uh, you know, this Cathay recognizing the roots is very French. Um, yep. I think you were telling me that even the EAs get, uh, you know, get a share of the success. So yep. talk to us. I mean, you've also had to do a little bit of a, you know, we, we've switched roles here where you've had to, change or adapt uh, into the culture um, of Asia. And I, I talked about the likability graph in Asia, you know, potentially in most places, if you're more outspoken, your likability is a little bit less. So you need to be managing that. How have you thought about culture and uh, have you, do you agree? Is this something that you observe as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just on, just on your first question is, is this normal? It's, it's not right. So most, most firms are a little bit more, you know, individualistic to the investor. Um, a lot of the global firms that are even based in Southeast Asia still are very local in nature and, and, and have mm -hmm. a few connections to their, to the other, um, to their other parts of the world, but, but not, they're, they're, they're incredibly loose. Right. Um, right. and so I think, uh, I think Cathay in that respect is, is, is quite unique and, and quite different as a model. It may not be the best or the worst. Well, you know, time will tell once, once, you know, we have multiple vintages of it. Um, but as far as I'm concerned in terms of winning and, and being successful, uh, on, in, in the job, um, it's, it's, you know, I've had immense confidence instilled in me by Nick here and then Denis mm -hmm. and Ingpo, um, who are our two founders um, in France and in, in China. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, culture, uh, it's, it's been interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say, uh, I would say, and we talked about this a bit in, in, in the prelude, but um, I'm, I'm a New Yorker at heart. And, and so what that means is, uh, I love my pizza. I'm incredibly outspoken, um, right. and I'm incredibly direct. Uh, and and you know, two two of those things sometimes don't don't work well in uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and and I find myself getting into trouble for being too outspoken or too direct sometimes. Um, but I've I've found a niche and a part of the world and a part of the market that I think uh, appreciates uh, the the candidness. Um, and, 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 and ask for more of it. So I, I feel like things are okay at the moment. <laughs> at the moment, I'll check in again at another time. <laughs> talk, talk, talk to me in two or three years. <laughs> I will, I will for sure. Now let's talk then, you know, as a, this is a perfect segue. We're already talking about the differences. Uh, let's talk about the state of play here in Asia. I know you have yeah. a very particular view. Um, you know, my question to you, we've had um, recent news actually, after the hype of the Grab deal, you know, that was supposed to be happening Q3 with Altimeter, it's now pushed out to Q4 in May. There was a bit of a nosedive of uh, Altimeter, the SPAC vehicle of 28%, right? So yep. there's certainly, I, I mean, generally, I, I've been watching SPACs as well. There's a little bit of a sell-off and uncertainty. But talk to us a little bit of the state of the play here in Asia. Are we in a bubble? Are we drinking a little bit of our Kool-Aid? What do you think? 
Yeah. So, so the SPAC stuff, um, I think, uh, is, you know, um, highlights a, a, a really good, um, uh, a, a really, really good part of the market that there's still a bunch of work that we need to do to get our companies public ready. Right. And, um, and that the market fundamentals are there, but the company fundamentals are being force fitted to a little bit. Uh, and we're celebrating a little bit too early. The SPAC market has softened. There's no doubt about it. We're feeling it as well in a couple of our portfolio. Um, and and so, you know, I, I don't see this as a minor a minor blip. I see this as a full on course correction, which is okay. It's mm. it's perfect because we were in a fairly inflated and heated environment. I'd rather have a a much more neutral environment that goes the long the long haul as opposed to a short you know hot market. Um, but we'll see. In terms of um, you know the the Southeast Asian market, you know, look, look revenue and um, valuation uh, cover all problems, <laughs> um, and unfortunately, we're still seeing record record high you know valuation for even pre revenue companies, uh, and so I think that there's much of a correction that still needs to occur. Much of Physics needs to, still needs to be put into place um, because it'll it'll it, it'll history history has said that this never this has never ended well right uh, for one mm. way or the other either companies will need to grow into their valuation and will struggle um, or markets will you know come back to normal and 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 you know that that next valuation round won't be a great return for those investors uh, and so. I think we are, you know, eating, drinking a little bit of our Kool-Aid. I think that, you know, uh, the the high valuations are masking a lot of problems, a lot of cultural problems, mm-hmm. structural, business model, product market fit, channel fit, um, and those will those will sort of unearth itself in in uh, in in a few years. You know, I was talking to my ex boss, who's at uh, PwC last late last mm-hmm. night, and. The, they, they've stopped taking on more work um, because there's just too many deals happening um, and, and their teams are ragged thin. And so as a yeah. result, he, he's like, you know what? We, we're in a situation right now where you've got record high valuations and very little diligence. And so it'll be interesting mm. to see, you know, four, five, six years from now, how the vintages of these funds actually performed. Um, and, and I echo that, um, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of that in the market. We'll lose a lot of times to, to, to really, uh, eye watering valuation. And we just can't understand how, you know, wh- where the, where the exit shows up in, in three or four years. Um, yeah, we'll so, so this is worrying, right? I mean, the fact that, and, and we've seen this, right, where, um, there's a lot of hype. We talk about unicorns as an obsession with valuation without the fundamentals. And we've seen this in, in the United States in many ways where years later, you know, um, there's still no revenue. There's no, um, you know, the profitability, excuse me, the profitability is not at the level that it should be. Revenues may look fancy, uh, and, and good, but like you said, mask a lot of, of the little problems. And with Southeast Asia and Asia where, where you work, Particularly, there's a lot of focus on the big names, right? Which I, I think there's a little bit of talk of consolidation. They're super apps. They're all almost doing the same thing. There was yeah. the go-to announcement as well. Um, how, how are you viewing the growth opportunity, particularly because you're investing, you know, your your check size, I think what expose, what you're exposed to in evaluating your deals gives you a little bit of a fuller view of, okay, companies that get to the stage, are we seeing what are you seeing? Are we seeing enough growth? Is there a lot more to be desired? What What are you seeing at your level of um, investment? Yeah, so our, our levels, um, Series A to Series C, um, 5 to 20 as your first check. Uh, so we're early, early enough, I would say. Um, but, 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 but these days, our, our 15 to 20 is like a good Series A, <laughs> as yeah. when, when it used to be like a Series B or a Series C. Um, I would say... At a very macro level, right? If you if you zoom out the aperture, um, what I think, um, what I feel about the region is we're in the golden period of of a very very long upward trend in Southeast Asia. I do think that you know in in some places and not all, but a few investors and a few startups have really you know come in and, and blown up the market um, and 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 are you know are. are 
investing ahead of ahead of the growth and ahead of the business model and ahead of the monetization. Um, but I think for everybody else, there's a lot of great companies in a lot of great portfolios. And if, if I look at the macro, I think we'll do really, really well. Uh, and we'll look at this period of time where everyone who's investing in Southeast Asia will look really smart because they invested in this or that, the other thing. But the, the truth is everyone's going to do well, is, 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 my, is my view. Um, mm. The consolidation piece, um, I think, is, is really healthy um, because it's really hard to take on eight countries in Southeast Asia by yourself. It's really capital inefficient if you're, if you're competing with another player that's trying to do the exact same thing. And so I think the con con consolidation is really healthy because it allows you to get to that scale faster and allows you to get the profitability faster. But it also allows you to drive new business models and more innovative business models that are not copycats from China or from the US. Uh, and so what started as, you know, a copycat business model has now all of a sudden morphed into something that is so much better than any of their counterparts, right? And I, and I, see, I think we'll see more of those types of examples over time. Um, but if I take macro view, um, I would not. I would rather be investing in no place else um, than Southeast mm. Asia, with the exception of maybe Latin America at the moment. Uh, it, it, right. Just amazing fundamentals, amazing ecosystem being built, amazing set of founders being created, a lot of talent coming through, a lot of new talent coming through. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's prime time, as far as I'm concerned. It's prime time, and and I, I think Nick had a similar view as well, where we talked a little bit about the arbitrage opportunity, and and that's part of your job, as I hear it, which is to look at yeah. where where's the talent, where's the low cost talent that are really great to build into these markets that would be paying high value, right? So can you talk to us a little bit about? building in Asia. And, and I want you to give a really candid view as well, because you talked a little bit about it and being careful of not drinking our own Kool-Aid here, but you talked about the cultural, the structural, the fundamentals that it, some of it is really hard, right? If you can give specific examples of building in Asia here, that would be super helpful. Yeah, absolutely. We have a company um, that we just invested in and they're in all eight countries in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And, you know, between the language differences and the regulatory differences uh, and, and hiring talent as practices, uh, it is really difficult to scale. It's not the equivalent of eight states in, in the US, right? It is complete different countries. And so starting up and is, is almost like rediscovering product market fit, you know, five, six, seven, eight times. In my last role, I operated uh, we operated across six different countries in Southeast Asia, and it was the exact same thing. Every single one was a totally different environment, right? And so it is really, really hard to build um, a business here that gets scaled uh, uh, regionally and to do that in a capital efficient manner. And so the folks that are doing it are doing it by being incredibly innovative with how they think about their business models from the ground up are doing it because they're open to collaborations and partnerships much earlier than everybody else. Um, and in some cases are looking for consolidation opportunities to really come together as a, as a tinier or bigger force early uh, in sort of taking on the market. Um, what, what I've seen as an interesting part of the market, um, so I feel like a lot of, you know, regional VCs kind of go on one side and, and then I, you know, Nick and I are kind of going the other to, to a certain degree is we've stumbled upon a ton of teams that are being built here um, and but have exported their product or their service to other parts of the world and are doing incredibly well. So we just offered a term sheet to a founder in Enterprise SaaS two days ago. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that she, she took it. She started here and then she, when she found product market fit, she moved to the States to San Francisco and she's built a, you know, 10, $12 million uh, ARR business um, competing with, you know, in a, in a $30 billion segment and competing and competing and winning, right? Enterprise clients. And to me, that is, there's no greater test that Southeast Asian tech has arrived when the tech that's being built here can compete with the best in the world anywhere else in the world. 
Um, and so for us, that that's the niche where we think that there's a cool little arbitrage opportunity of finding, you know, the next Zoho or the next Fresh Desk yeah. in Southeast Asia and in India that we can then export out to other parts of the world. And there's no better firm position to do that, given how our global network kind of comes together for that. Yeah, so so I love this, you know, uh, local opportunity, find the product market fit and get to a point of let's, you know, go for the big boys, right? Let's go um, in a bigger market in the US. And one of your recent investments, Coherent, uh, is, is a good example. I believe they have US and J- Japan are, are the primary markets. Um, how have you seen, you know, and I'm thinking about the founders who are tuning here at that point of inflection of making that decision, that leap into a new market. How have they done well? You know, what 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 does it take to really um, expand into a whole new market and do that well? Yeah, so so coherent um, started in Hong Kong, um, and and then sort of bubbled up, and then uh, I, I'd say John's success. Although you should have him on the show because he's 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 a billionaire in the making. I, I guarantee it. Um, but John's success is hiring amazing talent in in who know insurance really well in different parts of the world, know the subject matter really well, and then leaving them the heck alone. And so he mm. gives them a really good product. Um, he studies how that product could be localized if it needs to be localized. Um, and then he hires amazing team members who are deep subject matter experts in that space. He overpays, triple overpays. He gets the best talent and then he leaves them the hell alone and he lets them do their thing. And it has been miraculous how that business has scaled um, and, and, and in such a short period of, uh, of time, um, specifically in the US, in Japan, in other parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, there are 10, 10 countries, I think two more on the map shortly. Um, and with very little churn of, of their customer base. And so it is, it is really a phenomenal business. And so, you know, for founders listening, I would say, you know, once you have a good product in one market, spend the time up, up front, really understanding why you want to be in market number two, customizing the product to get there, and then hiring the best team to really uh, work on your distribution to, to essentially make sure that that, uh, that launch and, and that market's a success for you. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that. You know, I'm just reading this other book on uh, the Amazon story, the Everything Store, uh, by Brad Stone, and it's excellent. Yeah. But it's it's funny, you know, the way you you talk about John about how he recognizes talent. Jeff Bezos Bezos actually did the opposite thing, right? You know, he's known to be very frugal. I think in the early yeah. days, he was still making his staff that used to be from high flying positions in in top corporates that were used to business class f- fly commercial and yeah. really did it a very different way and and yeah. i'm curious as you're looking at different leaders right again you know for the founders that are tuning in what are some of the mistakes that they've made in scaling especially at, at your important uh, check size of of that inflection point right which is make or break yeah for for us i think the mistake in scaling is not knowing why you want to scale outside of top line mm. uh so why you want to be in that country what are the lead indicators or what are the signals that have allowed you to be in that country um, force fitting certain parts of monetization, i.e. your pre-revenue and you now need to get your revenue because you've taken a big check and now, you know, your investors demand it. Um, to me, those are the two parts where the, you don't really find the product market fit early. You haven't really spent the time to customize, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, you could get away with that in other parts of the world, but, you know, Thailand is very different from Indonesia. Vietnam is very different from Malaysia. And if you do not know those nuances and you don't um, cater your product, your go-to-market, your service, your messaging, um, then you come off as, as tone deaf and you, you, you burn a bunch of capital trying to do that. And so for those reasons, it's, um, it's really, really hard um, for, for founders, like I said, to get it right. And so I'm incredibly empathetic about how they scale in this region. Um, but, but it's important to take the time to, to really understand why you want to be where you, you know, where you want to be and, and how you plan to get there for the founders that, you know, want to go to the States. It's this clear mission that, you know, uh, we found them mostly in enterprise SaaS and it's this clear mission that 
enterprise SaaS isn't being acquired or being bought here in the same way it's being bought in Western Europe and in, in parts of the U.S. And so we definitely need to go there. Um, in, and, what, and, in what way, Rajiv? In what way so, do you so, mean that? So typically, typically Asian enterprises are, are lagged behind their Western counterparts in adopting uh, enterprise technology and enterprise software. And then there's this uh, willingness to pay for it that's just not here, uh, not here, not mm. in India, parts of South Asia. And so when you're a startup founder and you're like, okay, well, how do I get somebody to pay me, you know, $49.99 for a piece of software, an accounting piece of software, or how do they pay me, you know, two, three thousand dollars for for an HR piece of software as an enterprise? Um, you'll never find that market here as much as you'll find it in Japan or in Australia, uh, which are the closest to us, or the states. Right. And so a lot of founders who are building that tech here are building it laser focused that that's the market that they want to go to, and and you'll see a lot of them start here and then make that leap over to the states. John John will be a perfect example of that, where right. he knew that his biggest market is the U.S. and at some point will will eventually move there. Uh, well, he's he's already told us that <laughs> that that yeah. we we need a budget and a relocation package for him. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, in 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 all seriousness, I think knowing your market yeah. early is, is hugely important. Right. And, and what can they do, you know, to really understand and be tactical about this? I mean, you know, I want, I want to also, the, the, the reason I ask for specific examples here and, and the how, you know, is because it's, it's helpful, right? You know, if I, I see it, um, I can be it, right? So how, how have you seen founders be tactical? Is it about first identifying when you talk about talent, uh, someone who perhaps is in a competitor and then poaching them? And having that conversation, or is it about finding, you know, I, I know um, like in SoftBank, they have someone like Lydia who really helps with thinking about partnerships and things like that. What, what have you seen to be a tactical strategy here that works? Yeah, I found the partnerships and the business development work really well. Um, I, mm -hmm. I found that part, uh, founders who spend time in that market work really well. I'll give you a really good example, right? So um, there's this company called the Asian Network, Roshni's, Roshni uh, Mehtani's company. Um, and she's got like, I don't know, some bonkers amount of moms on the network, like 35 million right. or something like that. And, um, and she, she's a phenomenal founder and she knew that she needed to go into Malaysia and Indonesia and all of these other markets. And she physically with, you know, husband, kids, the whole thing, mm -hmm. physically jumped in and spent time, like literally left Singapore and went and lived there to build those businesses and to understand the market and understand the community, did it once, failed, then came back, then did it again in another market, succeeded wildly, then did it in a third, fourth, fifth. Um, and so that's learning by doing, or that's action and yeah. motion, right? Um, and so she's, you know, one of my prime examples. We're not investors, so, <laughs> but, um, but I'm a <laughs> fan um, in, um, and how she was able to kind of build that and, and, and sort of see that through. So that's, you know, one example. Yeah. Another one is, um, you know, really studying the market. So a lot of times, you know, you'll raise your series A, you'll raise your series B, and all of a sudden you'll go like, boom, 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 boom. We're going to be in this market. Mm -hmm. We're going to be this thing and that thing. And it's often uh, as the board, our, uh, you know, our thing is to not be the cheerleader for a lot of that, but to be really thoughtful and really good sounding board for decision making and to say, actually, no, look, stop. Let's actually think about how we do this. How do we partner? How do we, you know, try our product market fit? How do we have an MPV and a go to market model that or go to market motion that makes sense without right. spending too much cash before we go full full on? Right. And so. I think, um, you know, the, the truth sort of lies somewhere in between and obviously different, different businesses have different models. Um, some never leave Indonesia, for example, and that's perfectly fine too. Um, but for us, what we found that's really worked really well is to, is to spend the time, um, whether you're there physically or testing to with, uh, with partnerships, but spend the time because, uh, it's really, they're really expensive mistakes to have to pull back yeah. later on. Yeah, and, and talking about expensive mistakes, top of the call there uh, today, you, you said something about how in Asia, you might not be able to recover from making a mistake. 
Uh, yeah. And and I just want to double click on that with regard to also now, you know, um, in, in the introduction, we as, as part of what we were um, learning about, you know, Southeast Asia and all that is the fact that a lot of companies are private for a lot longer than, you know, in the US or more developed markets. And there is a little bit of an itch. And, you know, Michael Lin's our friend came up with the exit landscape, right? But the reality is in Southeast Asia, there are a lot of these companies that have been actually private for very long where investors have not exactly cashed out and are, are feeling a little bit antsy right now. And that's why we, we are hearing of all these um, big news, right? And that reveals actually underneath people are looking for exit opportunities. And I want to also, you know, have, have your view on that. And also, uh, I know you have a keen interest in India. Uh, understand that your finance minister in, in, in India had put a bit of a lockdown on SPACs as an alternative yeah. exit strategy. And, and in India, that's what, 50,000 startups and 100 unicorns, what, 120 billion valuation that's all being locked up there. Uh, you yeah. know, SPACs in the US being an attractive opportunity for many, right? And and people are hunting now. I think there's there's a hunt for more deals outside of the United States now for foreign uh, SPAC targets. So what's your view on this? You know, are, are we at a stage where we will eventually get to a point of, ah, there's going to be, you know, better exit opportunities or are we going to be patient yeah. for a very long time without capital? I think we need to be patient. Um, uh, I think we're, as a, as a collective region, there's much to celebrate. Um, but also as a collective region, uh, we're, we're trying to run before, before we walk. Um, you know, if you think about Southeast Asia, the first VCs, um, the first institutional VCs really started to show up in the early 2010s or, or so. Um, and, and before that, largely unheard of. Um, and so if you think about it, it's only 10 years. It's only been 10 years. And yes, that's many fun cycles or um, in, in some cases and many vintages. Um, but, in, but in reality, this will be 20, 30 years before you start seeing um, exits happening on a regular basis in a framework or in a setting in Singapore or in Hong Kong that, that, that sort of opens that out. And, and that's perfectly fine. And that's actually really healthy. Um, and so I think that, you know, as investors, we want to have those exits because it allows us to raise the next fund and get more, you know, fees and and and, and sort of have a job for 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 the yeah. future. But the reality is, um, some sometimes it's not healthy. It's not healthy for the investors. It's not healthy for the community. It's not healthy for the shareholders that will take on that asset. It's not healthy for the startup who has to grow into that valuation. And so, for all of those reasons. Um, I, I sit on the side of, you know, I'd rather things cool down a bit and, and we go longer, but are a lot more sustainable. Um, and, and it's the exact same thing with India. India, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how we unlock so much value. There's, a, there's yeah. quite a buoyant secondaries market um, that's starting to, to, mm. to form. Um, and there's a lot of U.S. investors that are coming in and sort of parking um, and, and buying up a lot of... Um, uh, equity, knowing that, you know, someone will figure this out at some point down the line, whether it's five, 10 years from now, and they have to with that much capital being locked up. Right. Um, yeah. But but in the short term, there's, there aren't stacks happening. There's, there's not going to be a lot of, of, of news there in, in, mm. in way of, I think you have one or two examples that are coming up very recently of, of IPO listings um, and, and IPO listings in India on the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, without profitable companies is almost unheard of. So it'll be very interesting to see, um, you know, how they how they perform and how they fare as a public company. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, it's uh, I, I would I would rather things cool down a bit. And then to your earlier question about about failure, right? Um, mm. You know, I think I think as as a startup ecosystem, we we drum for entrepreneurs to take on risks. But I feel like. There's a there's still a little bit of a delta between Asia and at least you know be, between the America that I left a few years ago uh, in terms of how we acknowledge failure. Um, there's a lot of startups that have had uh, poor exits um, or you know they were advertised as great exits, but in reality they were they were not great performance, um, and and no one was happy with the outcome. And we don't talk about it. Uh, it's just swept under the carpet. We say you know the headline reads you know, so-and-so, blah, 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 great exit. 
but in reality, you know, that founder may have may struggle to do that next thing uh, because of hmm. because of that. A lot of the times, founders step down um, from 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 their roles because you know they 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 outgrew where the company was. Uh, the company outgrew where where their capability was, um, and and those founders have a hard time coming kind of getting back up onto that next thing, uh, and get have a hard time getting funded again. Um, and so I don't think we address um, failure in this part of the world wholeheartedly uh, as, as much as we do success. And I think that that also needs to, to change as part of another signal in, in maturing of, uh, of the ecosystem. And, and how do we change that? I think it's, I think it's dialogue. Uh, I think you'll see mm-hmm. a lot more failures. Um, and, and I think that, you know, as you have a more diverse set of investors um, in this part of the world and you're starting to see a lot of them come in come in from the west you start to you'll start to get an ecosystem that acknowledges that you know these are essentially very well calculated bets and sometimes they don't pay off and that's that's you know there's a whole host of reasons for it and you know there's always a second and a third chance um and so i I think it doesn't change overnight i think it changes over a long period of time Uh, but i do think it changes and it has to uh if if you really look as like the, all of the other indicators of maturity are there. You have, you yeah. know, the big grabs spawning off a bunch of other startups. You have really good tech teams. You have really good product teams. Um, this is one part uh, culturally that we still haven't, you know, fully gotten right yet. Yeah. Well, and I'm hopeful that, you know, with investors like you at Cafe to recognize that, right? So when a founder comes to you, door, I think it's a matter of giving that second chance. And um, actually, you know, you know, my, my, my work, we work, with a lot of fund managers. And I always use the example of um, even asking the intern for all this job experience and putting in your pattern of success that a lot of people have been excluded from, right? So yeah. even this failure should be the fact that they're trying and willing to try and risk uh, should be, I think, um, a yardstick of, you know, this person is entrepreneurial and is willing to do the hard thing and, and fail for it. So it, it takes, I'm hopeful it that. Takes- an immense amount of courage uh, yeah. to put everything on the line, to quit, to take your savings, your husband's savings, and <laughs> your, your mom and dad and, and anybody else that has any money and, and put it towards uh, an endeavor that you think uh, is, is needed in society. Um, it, it takes an immense amount of courage and, and I have full amount of respect for that. And if you didn't get it right the first time, that's okay. There'll, there'll be others. You know, I, I haven't gotten a lot right in my life uh, on, on many occasions. And, and, you know, I don't see a gun to my head. So I feel like, um, I feel like uh, you know, we, we need to adopt a little bit more of that thinking. Great. And, and you know, I, I fully agree there, Rajiv. And this gives me a perfect segue to the final segment. You know, you're almost off the hook here. Billion dollar <laughs> questions. Eight questions. <laughs> I know I've been, I've been pushing your buttons a little bit, but I love it. Uh, eight, eight questions. <laughs> First thing that comes to mind, so just a one-liner, okay? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> high is high. I don't, I don't have highs or lows. Uh, and, and you could ask any of, 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 our team, of my team that or folks that I've worked with in the past or folks that know me. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, like, non-excitable um, and, mm. and, and try, to, try to not invest too much energy in, in this or, or in, you know, sulking. Um, I, I, I really more of a process person where I enjoy processes and if I can get, you know, a certain part of the execution, right. I, I take a win from that. If I get it wrong, I mm. understand why, but I don't celebrate. So like term sheet will come in, you know, uh, the founder of a very competitive round, uh, accepted our term sheet. We were super happy. We were leading the series B Nicholas came to the office. He's like, where, when do we, you know, where, where do I, let's pop the champagne, let's pause, like, yeah. I'm not in, but I want to get through diligence and I want to wire the money as quickly as humanly possible <laughs> before they change their mind. Um, and so for me, That's it's true. not, it's not, um, it's not success or, or sorry, it's not highs or lows. It's, I, I try and be as, as no, like as level. Level-headed. As, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Sorry, Maybe sorry. now I have to go and now I have to go and talk to Natasha, your wife, to really, really see if this is true. You should. She, 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 I should. Yeah. She'll, she'll tell you the same. She, I, I have okay. to feign optimism for my son. 
Oh my goodness. Oh Lord. Okay. Second one. When you think of the word successful, who do you think of and why? Uh, I think of my dad um, as, mm. as successful, somebody that's sort of come, come from absolutely nothing uh, as a, as a child growing up in India to building businesses, um, building, you know, generational wealth for him, for his brothers, for his sisters, getting all of them married, kind of being the, the, the patriarch of the family. Yeah. Um, I sort of think of him as, as, as my North star for success. I think of our founder, Ming Ko, yeah. actually, the Chinese person, went to study in France, uh, saw a business opportunity, didn't speak a word of French, but saw a business opportunity, ended up building a massive business and then raising capital as a private equity yeah. investor, never done that before, and then moving back to China. Uh, so I think of success as, as that, but not because they, they went from nothing to a, a lot of money, but from mm. being largely resourceless to incredibly resourceful and having the ability mm. to help many, many people along the way and create societal value. And so for me, that's kind of where, where success is. Um, not so much, you know, the, the, the dollars in the sense. Right. Best although, advice although, that you've been given. Sorry. Uh, I said, although the dollars in the sales sense definitely help, um, but, yeah. but they're not the all and end all. Um, and and they matter, advice. right? <laughs> they matter. They 100% matter. We wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this if it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Best advice you've been given. See the ball, hit the ball. Um, cricket coach uh, in mm. high school, he would say, you know, there's going to be a lot of distractions around you and people are doing a lot of different things and trying different tactics. Um, as long as you keep seeing the ball and you keep hitting the ball and you keep repeating that and do that over and over and over again, you'll be fine and life will be okay. Um, mm. And that's true. If you actually think about it, we're distracted by millions of things every day, little bits and pieces that take our, you know, micro pieces of information that take away our attention. And is if you can sort of see the ball um, and, and, and hit the ball and, and just constantly do that in whether you're trying to lose weight, whether you're trying to get a new deal, whether it, whatever it is you're trying to do, uh, whatever goal you've set yourself, you keep just being consistent at it and just yeah. focus on it, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of get ahead. System and processes are right? very consultant of you. I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, now this is a good one for you. Consultant, favorite tool and hack for productivity. Um, this is not a consulting thing, but um, if you get an opportunity to do anything, uh, and this is, this is what I do. If I get an opportunity mm. to do anything, I will say yes first. I'll figure it out later on. Um, but I will always, my disposition is to always say yes first to, to, to anything. And I found that uh, that has gotten me into so many places that I never would have been able to get to uh, if I overthought it even for two seconds. And so my Got immediate it. disposition is leaning forward and saying yes to everything. And then I'll, I'll find a way to get it done later on. Right. So and it's a productivity hack because you don't waste time thinking about it. You just say yes. I is that just say yes. Uh, I just say yes, and it gets me into into certain situations and access into certain places that uh, that I wouldn't have gotten access to had I overthought that situ solution or situation. Right. Next one. Best investment that you've made. It can be time, money, um, you know, focus, whatever it could be in the last eighteen months. In the last eighteen months, mm -hmm. or can I go longer? Can I go like all my yeah, life? Sure. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say my. Uh, uh, business school. So going to Cornell, um, that changed mm. my life forever. Um, uh, it got me into consulting. It got me to think about things a different way. And every, every now and then I'll meet a Cornell alum that will offer me an opportunity or offer me some advice or offer me something that will, that will dramatically change things. The deal that Nick might've talked to that we, that we won, that was a pretty competitive yeah. deal as a Cornell alum. Um, mm. and, so it's Cornell for me has been the gift that just keeps on giving. And I feel like that'll, that'll be forever in perpetuity. So I will always be grateful for, for Cornell and Big Red. That's a good one. And uh, I know you've spent uh, in your short retirement uh, of six months, you read a lot of books. What is the one book that has influenced your th thinking greatly? Oh, God. <laughs> just one. You have to choose just one. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> Um, 
there's uh, there's there's so many. Um, thinking fast, acting slow. Uh, there's there's a ton. Uh, I, I could I could give you a whole list, but yes. Okay, so, thinking so thinking fast and slow. Yeah, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah. Uh, why right. why? Um, I think it it sort of puts things into perspective. Um, and and be and, and for me, it's um, it's a really good you know. Well, I I read it at a time that we were just moving you know just moving here, and I was struggling between paces. Uh, of North America and of here, and so it really puts into perspective how you should um, how you should take the time to process what you are processing, um, and before you sort of put it into motion. And it's it's something that a lot of I find myself reflecting on a lot of times when thinking about business plans for our founders. Yeah. Okay. Final question: With your son, um, you know the three qualities that you want him to have as the, the number three top values? Three top values. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, empathy. Mm-hmm. Um, optimism. And resilience. I think he's got two. So he's naturally an optimistic human being, but he, he's also five. So I, I guess they all are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> At that, at that point, um, he's incredibly kind. So he's incredibly mm-hmm. empathetic. Um, I don't know if that's because he's been raised like our, like our third pet uh, and with, with the other two, um, but he's kind with everybody uh, and, and everyone that will meet, meets him or interacts with him says he's incredibly kind and thoughtful human being. And then resilience, he hasn't been tested yet. I mean, I haven't taken away his toy room or anything yet. So, <laughs> so, so we I'll check in on that. And yeah, another thing yeah. to check check back on in a couple of years with you, I will do Three that. Four sure. years, let him go through some heartache. Let's see how resilient he is. <laughs> and we'll take it from there. <laughs> Love that. All right. Well, Rajiv, thank you so much for your time. I mean, I think we went through quite a fair bit here, from you know the Beyond uh, Series A opportunity, the growth opportunity, the challenges, heartbreaks, backs, failure, all of the above, and and you know what you wish for the future of your son and and your legacy really in him. So, so thankful for you. So grateful for your leadership and to all of you tuning in. Thank you. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe so you can hear great stories like that from Rajiv and that we can all keep making billion dollar moves. Thanks, Rajiv. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. See ya. Bye.